Hello everyone, my name is Dom Hebblethwaite and I'm Head of Membership at the Chartered Institute of Linguists, CIOL. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our online roundtable, exploring the range of exciting employment opportunities for professional linguists within the United Nations and the European Union, particularly for those translators and interpreters whose first language is English. Let's introduce you to our distinguished panel of experts for this roundtable, from the European Commission, the United Nations and higher education. First up from Brussels, we have Marilena Gianni Dinardi. Marilena is Deputy Head of the English and Irish Interpretation Unit at the European Commission and the former graduate of the University of Leeds. Marilena, lovely to have you here. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so our second panelist is Megan Rees. Um, Megan works for the English Translation and Editorial Service of the United Nations in New York and is a former graduate of the University of Bath. Megan, it's great, great for you to, uh, great that you can join us. How are you today? Hey, um, uh, great to be here. Thanks very much for having me. Wonderful. Um, and finally, we welcome Louise Jarvis. Louise is a part-time lecturer in conference interpreting at the University of Bath and the freelance conference interpreter and translator working for international organizations such as the EU institutions, the International Court of Justice and the European Patent Office. Louise, thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. It's great to be here and thanks for having me. Wonderful, wonderful. OK, so just to update you all on the format for this roundtable, we have a very large audience. Over 700 people had registered for this event when I checked this morning. Um, and we're going to start off with some polling to help us understand you, our audience, and to give a feel for everyone else um, who is attending along with you. We'll then have presentations from each of our panelists before moving on to the Q&A section. And just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. As I mentioned, we have a very large audience. So in order to manage the session effectively, everyone's camera and microphone has been switched off. For the Q&A, all questions will be managed via the questions panel facility you have there. So please do just go ahead and post your questions as we go along and we will cover as many as we can. OK, so to begin, we have five quick and fun polls to start us off. Um, just a reminder, all these polls are anonymous. We do not keep the results or use them for any other purposes. Um, it's just to get a feel for you, our audience, and hopefully then to provide you with the most pertinent information possible. So if we could load the first um, poll question up. Uh, a very easy one, yes or no, are you a COL uh, member? Um, we'll hold this open for um, five seconds or so. If you could um, get your votes um, in, please. Um, OK, um, and we'll close the first poll. So we have 46% uh, members. 54% not members. Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, if we could load up the second question. Um, so what are you most interested uh, here? What are you um, looking for out of this round table? Are you interested in working as a translator for either the EU or UN, working as an interpreter, uh, other linguist roles within the EU or UN, whatever they may be, um, or you're not sure or potentially interested in, in all of them? Uh, all of the above. So we'll um, um, keep this um, open for uh, a few more seconds. The votes are coming in. And just a couple more seconds. OK, I think we can close that poll. Um, and we have 41% interested uh, in working as a translator, 20% interpreter, 10% interested in other roles. and. Um, just about a third uh, either unsure or interested potentially in, in all of the above so that's um that's great um we'll load up the third question so what stage in your career as a linguist are you at at the moment are you a student are you early career uh, or an experienced linguist already um and um we'll, we'll keep this open for a few um more seconds we're getting the votes coming in thank you very much okay we'll hold this open for another uh three seconds okay that's great we can close that there okay so 16 percent students 22 percent early career and 
20, and 61% sorry experience fantastic okay thank you very much um, so our next question is English your native language simple yes no the votes are coming in we'll hold this open for another few seconds okay that's great we can close that thank you very much um, so 43% yes 57% no so a fairly um, even split okay very interesting okay um, and then the uh, last poll question please um, and this is just for the 43% who um, said yes um, if you answered to uh, yes to English being your native language um, what is your other language or, or your other languages um, are they uh, or is, is it EU languages language or languages UN languages um, which are French Spanish Russian Chinese Arabic along with English of course um, or other languages um, great so we're getting the votes um, coming in we'll just hold it open for just a, a couple more seconds thank you very much everybody okay um, okay so we have um, EU languages 62%, UN languages 66%, um, and other languages not included there, um, 18%. Wonderful. That was very, very helpful. Thank you, everyone, for um, doing that. Um, that. That's really helped us a, a lot. Um, and we're ready to move on to Marilena's presentation now about working as an interpreter for the EU Commission. Um, and just to start us off, we've actually got a short um, video to play. Um, so I wonder if we could um, load that up for everybody and um, uh, play the video. Um, that doesn't I'm seem to be sorry it looks like we've got a technical issue with the video for some reason okay so so apologies everyone uh, for that um, we, we will see I believe the video is not yet uh, officially share shareable um, Marilena but uh, we'll, we'll see maybe if we can um, send that as a follow-up um, in, in due course for everybody with a follow-up um, email okay um, Marilena, then, in that case, we're ready to go over to you. Would you like to take the controls and begin your presentation? Yes, thank you. Um, so, I, just let me know if you can see my screen. We can do, yes. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. Apologies for the video there. Indeed, it's it's not been published yet, um, but we can I can certainly uh, find a way afterwards of uh, sharing that link with everybody. Um, but thank you very much. So um, my name is Marilena Andinardi, um, and I'm deputy head of the English and Irish unit at DG SCIC, which is the European Commission's interpreting and conferencing service. And I've just got a brief presentation, really, um, for you all about interpreting for Europe. Now, the disclaimer is that. Um, I work for the European Commission, I work for the European Commission's Interpreting Service, so it will this will be more commission heavy in a way in terms of the perspective, but I entitled the presentation Interpreting for Europe because actually even though the other EU institutions, so the European Parliament and the European Court of Justice have their own interpreting services, um, actually if you pass the European Union's accreditation test to be an interpreter you end up on a joint list and therefore you can work for either of the three institutions. I'll come back to that in more detail as I go through the slides. And as I say, this will be more commission focused because of my background, but please be aware that the interpreting opportunities that I'll talk about are also opportunities with the European Parliament and the European Court of Justice as well. Um, and this is just a brief um, slide to introduce you to DG SCIC. Um, which is you know, an acronym, we're very fond of acronyms uh, in the European Union. We're also known as DG Interpretation. Um, and it's a joint service, it's a joint interpretation and conferencing service. So this is just to show you that actually the DG as a whole is split into three directorates. 
we work with interpretation, but also conference organisation and meeting space management. But obviously the focus of my presentation is going to be on interpretation. Um, and within the within DG SCIC and across all of the EU institutions, there are three main modes of interpretation. And I've put them on the screen there. Uh, we are conference interpreters and we work mainly in simultaneous. So in a booth with the tools of our trade that you can see on the photo there, the console, the headsets, the microphone. We also work um, in consecutive uh, and consecutive interpretation, basically the speech is given, the interpreter takes notes, when the speech is over, the interpreter gives back the interpretation in the language that's needed. Um, that's not quite so often used, but it is still used within the European Commission. Uh, DG SCIC, we certainly use it. We use it for bilateral meetings. Uh, we use it for after dinner speeches, for example, sometimes. And the third uh, mode of interpretation, I've put that there as well, um, it's chuchotage or whispered interpretation, um, as it's known. And that really is for bilateral um, events, maybe bilateral negotiations between heads of state, for example, um, and where the interpreter will be sat next to the person they're interpreting for and will whisper the interpretation into their ear. So my next slide just tells you a little bit about what conference interpreters are, what kind of skills, what kind of qualities um, you need to be a conference interpreter. These are just a few, the highlights, if you like. So of course, uh, conference interpreters are highly proficient in all of their languages, including their mother tongue. Um, in the EU, we tend to work only into our mother tongue. There are exceptions, particularly for some of the more, um, uh, I was going to say exotic languages. By exotic, I mean the Eastern European languages, the ones that not, many, not very many people speak. Um, and there, we have a system where people will work bi-directionally, so they will, they will have a retour, as we call it but otherwise we tend to work into our mother tongue only and hence the importance of uh, mother tongue. Conference interpreters also, as you would expect, um, good communicators, um, able to adapt quickly and think on their feet and resourceful with language because language is one of the main tools that we have. We are communicating messages, ideas. It's also important to be able to stay calm under pressure. Um, and of course, we have to be well informed on EU current affairs and I've put intellectually curious. We work in a range of different meetings across a whole range of different topics and subjects. We can't be experts in all of them, but you have to have the curiosity to be able to do quick research into, into different fields. And that's what, I, that's what I mean there by intellectually curious. Um, and of course, well prepared and aware of the context of the different meetings that you're going to be interpreting at. And then uh, finally, as our profession changes somewhat, you need to be able to use the digital tools that we have at our disposal for meeting preparation and document management uh, and be able to use terminology databases um, and follow different thematic courses. Now my next slide is just a little bit of a reminder about multilingualism and why it's so important uh, and how it's been so important since the outset, since 1958, the Treaty of Rome, um, that it's enshrined in the treaties um, and that there are 24 official languages in the EU I just put the UN figures there as comparison. The UN obviously has fewer official languages. And then I've put this in specifically as well as a reminder. Um, Pre-Brexit, there were 28 member states in the European Union and 24 official languages. Currently, post-Brexit, 27 member states, sadly, of the European Union, but there are still 24 official languages, including English. Um, and just a reminder there that we have the Republic of Ireland who has English, um, as one of its official languages, and Malta to a lesser extent as well. And then within the Commission specifically, um, English is the Commission working language alongside French and German. Um, this is perhaps slightly different from the European Parliament, say, where there's perhaps a bit more multilingualism, but logistically and organisationally, it's not possible for all meetings that the Commission organises and holds to be full language regimes with 24 official languages. So what we find is that the Commission teams tend to work on drafting legislation in one of those three working languages. So quite often a lot of our meetings have smaller language regimes, but English is still very important even post Brexit. And as I've put there on the bottom, it's already and still is the language of choice for drafting and it's often the lingua franca as well in meetings. So even post-Brexit, English is still an important language within the EU. 
Now, as a service, DG SCIG provides interpretation not only to the European Commission, but also to the European Council, so the summits, the heads of state and government, also to the Council of the European Union, so the different working parties and the different formations in which the member states' representatives sit, but also we offer interpretation to the Committee of the Regions, the European Economic and Social Committee, the European Investment Bank, and some agencies and bodies in the member states as well. So actually DG SCIC offers interpretation to a range of clients, not just the European Commission. And that's why we are, by volume, I think the biggest interpreting service um, in the world. And just some figures there for you, for your, for your interest. So DG SCIC assigns around 1,200 interpreters to 40 meetings in Brussels on average on most working days. Um, and we have um, just average, average figures here. Most interpreters can interpret from four languages into their mother tongue. Um, some fewer, some more. Um, but I just thought that might be of interest to you. And then this uh, graph just gives you a breakdown of the meetings with interpretation into each language. Um, and this is interesting because you will see that the top language there in terms of meetings with interpretation into that language is English with 97%. And this is important because I told you that English is still very important, um, even post Brexit. And here you can see that it's very important because quite often without availability of English interpreters, there will be no interpretation offered at a meeting. And if there's no interpretation offered at a meeting, the meeting will not go ahead. So this is also another reason why um, English native speakers are so important and English natives that are interpreters are so important. And I'll expand on that a bit further in, in some of my other slides. So where might we work then, interpreters? I told you that we've got a range of clients and the the um, assignments can vary greatly as well. And there are some on the screen there, press conferences of the European Commission, plenary sessions in the Committee of the Regions, um, audit missions in the member states, different working parties on different topics like fisheries, um, space, research, etc. As an interpreter, variety really is the buzzword and variety in terms of the buildings that we work in, uh, in terms of the topics that we cover, in terms of the working hours as well. Um, it's not a set nine to five job, it's always different. But variety also in terms of the levels that we work at. So of course we can work at the very highest level for the heads of state and government, but we, we also work um, right the way down to the average European citizen. And last year, in fact, you know, with the, future, the conference on the future of the European Union, there were, Euro there were citizens panels meetings set up and we worked for the ordinary European citizens and we work you know at all levels in between that ministerials, um, practitioner level so for customs authorities and customs officers for example so it really is a huge huge variety um, and then I just put in some pictures there uh, to show you and here variety as well in terms of the type of meetings so the majority of our meetings now have gone back to fully in-person meetings um, but we have also changed our working methods a little bit uh, we do work in hybrid meetings more of course that prompted by the pandemic um, you know and when people couldn't travel uh, we do have hybrid meetings now where we have some people present in the room and some people connected up virtually and we do also occasionally have fully remote meetings where all participants join the meetings virtually, but the interpreters are all together in our booths in the meeting room. Uh, now, you might be wondering why I've put a, a picture of a wine glass on here. Um, it's not just because I'm thirsty after giving my presentation, but this is to point out um, that interpreters are an aging population. And the image of the wine glass is something that a former boss of mine, former head of unit, was particularly fond of. Now, these are the figures specifically for the English and Irish unit, but actually this trend of an aging population amongst interpreters is, is something that actually affects other language units as well. But you can see that the freelance average age is 48, uh, a staff interpreter average age 46. And over the coming three to four years, we are set to lose even more of our staff to retirement. Um, so this is why, it's another reason why we are doing so much outreach. Um, you know, 
we are trying to get the message out that Europe still needs you, particularly if you are an English native speaker. Um, the same trend, as I said, um, is also affecting other units. I, I, I don't have the exact figures to hand, but I know that the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Bulgarian unit are also particularly affected by this. And for those of you that are, are non-native English speakers um, in the audience, and I know there's quite a few of you, um, I can always try and get hold of figures for you um, and get them to you after the presentation if you're interested. So I've alluded to some of this already, but interpreters can be either permanent staff interpreters, either officials or temporary agents, or freelance interpreters. And in order to be a freelance interpreter, you need to have passed the international, the inter-institutional accreditation test. Now, um, I'm not going to focus too much on this. Um, suffice it to say that in order to be eligible to be permanent member of staff, you have to pass um, an internal competition, it's called. However, in order to be eligible for that, you need to hold an EU nationality. So if you are just a Brit, unfortunately, you wouldn't be eligible. Now that nationality requirement only applies to permanent staff and officials, not to freelance interpreters. So I'm going to focus on the freelance aspect at the moment um, and just go through that and I can give more information. Um, and there are, there are links to the um, commission website as well for more information on that. But basically as a freelance interpreter, um, in order to be eligible, um, you have to pass the inter-institutional accreditation test. Once you pass that test and are accredited, you're put into a joint database or a joint list. And this is what I mentioned right at the beginning of my presentation. Once you are on that list, um, and once you have been accredited inter-institutionally, in theory, you are free, available to work for any of the three institutions, the European Court of Justice, the European Parliament, or the European Commission, DG SCIC, in this case. Of course, as a freelance interpreter, it means there is no guarantee of work. It means that the contracts are, are offered on a daily basis, so you're paid on a daily basis for the contracts that you, um, that you accept and that you work. Um, that's the biggest difference between freelance um, and, and permanent staff. However, you know, um, on the plus side, if you're freelance, it means you're in charge of your availability and that you can decide, OK, I will make myself available for these days, but not these days, for example. So um, there are pros and cons to both. Um, here, it just gives you a bit more information about what you need to do if you're interested in becoming a freelance interpreter and what kind of things you need to be eligible. Um, so there you can see you need to have a university qualification in conference interpreting. Um, so uh, uh, um, that's normally a postgraduate, sorry. Um, or you can have any university qualification and a postgraduate uh, diploma um, in, uh, in interpreting or one year's professional experience. However, the professional experience needs to be backed up with evidence and the, yes, the professional experience needs to be conference interpreting experience. Uh, so we, when they screen applications, unfortunately, uh, public sector interpreting or court interpreting in a national context would not be accepted as professional experience. And the other thing that you need to be careful of is each language unit uh, sets a language profile. And currently for the English and Irish unit, um, if you are presenting an English A, so English mother tongue, you need two passive languages, two C languages that are EU official languages. The first one would have to be French or German, and the second one could be any other um, EU official language. Um, I can send you links to the website, um, which will give you much more information on that. Um, if necessary, and of course, I'd be willing to answer any questions that you might have. The final slide there, just uh, if you're interested, if you want to know more, if you want to see what we do, then you can follow us on a, on a number of uh, social media channels uh, that are up there um, and some links to our um, web pages as well. So I hope I haven't been too uh, long. I hope I haven't exceeded my time limit. I hope that was useful and I hope it's piqued your interest. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Absolutely fascinating. Um, 
uh, I wonder, could I ask you, could you just e e explain, obviously you've explained in, in general working um, for the EU, but could you explain a little bit about your own personal journey? Um, how did you get to work uh, as an interpreter for the EU Commission? Yes, yeah, certainly, yeah. Um, so I, I actually, I come from an Italian background, um, as you might have guessed by the name. Um, mm -hmm. I was born and raised in the northwest of England uh, to Italian parents, so I was brought up with languages. Um, and I've always had an interest and a flair for languages, uh, so it was natural for me to do languages at school, to go on to do languages at the University of Leeds for my undergraduate, actually. I started with French and Italian. Um, and then at the end of my degree, uh, I think I, I spent a long time thinking, well, I want to work with languages, but I don't know what to do. And I think a lot of people probably can identify with this. It was at the time it was kind of like, okay, I could be a translator, um, or I could teach, um, or I could work on a multilingual help desk. And, and none of those really appealed. But after university, I took a year out. I, I, um, I was a lectrice in a university in France, and I started looking at different options. And, and actually, I had done a um, liaison interpreting module in my final year uh, for French, which really piqued my interest. So I started looking into um, interpreting as a as a career and how I could get into it. Um, and then, as luck would have it, I came back to the UK and there was a master's um, in interpreting and translating just starting up at the University of Leeds. Now, I didn't make it in time to, to go into that first cohort, um, but I looked at the course, it looked really interesting. I worked for a year, got some money together, went back um, to Leeds the following year and did the masters. Really enjoyed it, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but really enjoyed it nonetheless. Um, and I was fortunate enough when I finished the masters in interpreting to pass the accreditation test at the EU straight away. So I moved to Brussels and at that time, there was a little, there was a newcomer scheme, which meant that I was guaranteed 100 days consecutive work, 100 consecutive days, rather, of interpreting, uh, which really gave me the chance. I mean, it gave me so much exposure. Um, I worked so hard during those 100 days um, and just got so much experience under my belt that then I went straight into, after that, working as a freelance. Um, and I worked on the freelance market, both the private market and the European institutions uh, market after that. And then I think two or three years after that, I was lucky enough that uh, an internal competition was published. So I applied, I took the internal competition, passed. I took up a staff post in 2008, I think it was. Um, and I've been here ever since um, and took up a de deputy head of unit post just two years ago. So I came to Brussels. I liked it so much that I stayed <laughs> and here I still am and I've added a couple of languages along the way as well. I started with French and Italian, I've added Spanish and I'm really working hard at the moment on German. <laughs> very good, very good. Oh, oh, okay, um, brilliant. Um, there, there's questions flying in and, and I do want to move to the next presentations but a couple of sp a sort of specific, very specific questions that have come in if, if, if you don't mind. Um, Somebody was asking what, what you meant by passive languages. Um, and then a, a second question is what level do your, your second languages or passive languages and need to be? I don't know whether it's according to the CFR or um, uh, anything else. Yes, yes, my apologies. Um, we, we get caught up in the jargon. So a passive language is a language that you work from. Um, so it, we, we have a language is mother tongue, B language uh, is a language that you work into, which is not your mother tongue. So if you have a retour, for example, or you work two ways in one language. And then a C language is a language that you work solely out of into your mother tongue. So for me, my passive languages are French, Italian and Spanish, and I work into English. Um, and then the level, I would say um, definitely kind of C1, C2. Um, well, C1, I would say. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, great. So, um, thank you, uh, Marilena. We now move over to New York um, and Megan's presentation on working as a linguist at the United uh, Nations. Hello, Megan, would you like to take over the controls? Yeah, sure. 
Okay, can you see my screen? See yes, we can. Perfect. So, hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you here today from New York. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, language careers at the UN. Um, so, uh, I'm a revisor here, um, and my core functions are translating, um, crazy writing, and editing. I've worked in New York for about um, seven years, and previously I was in Addis Ababa, also for the UN, uh, where I was um, editing for three years. Um, my presentation will focus primarily on the opportunities for people whose mother tongue is English. So um, here's a, an overview of all the places where we work. Um, the four main offices of the UN are UNHQ um, in New York, UNOV in Geneva, UNOV in Vienna, and um, UNON in Nairobi. There are also um, several regional commissions, which are located in Santiago, Addis Ababa, Beirut, Bangkok, um, and there's a small one in Geneva. These regional commissions, the offices are much, much smaller, so just two or three people. Um, the UN is one of the world's largest employers of language professionals. I think it's um, second behind the EU. Um, the the, the um, language services in New York and Geneva are the biggest. Mobility is highly encouraged. Um, so. Yes, staff are encouraged to move around, and since 2023, mobility is actually um, required. So newcomers will be required to move around after, I think it's after five years, um, according to the needs of the organization. Um, the documents that we work on vary a great deal depending on where you're working. So in New York, um, the focus is on peacekeeping and security council. Um, in UNOG, it's um, human rights, UNON, it's the environment, and Vienna, it's drugs and crime. So really quite different topics. Um, as uh, we've mentioned, the official languages are Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. So now I'm going to um, go into the different language functions at the UN, uh, which are translation, editing, beta reporting, praise writing, and interpretation. Um, the first of these areas I'm going to talk about is translation, which is um, the field I'm in. Um, so I'm going to be focusing specifically on the work of, uh, as I said, uh, the English translators. So we translate from the other official languages into English. Um, occasionally we also receive documents in non-official languages and where we have capacity we try to translate them in-house. Our workload in the English service is fairly small compared to the other translation services because increasingly UN documents are drafted in English. Uh, so the workload of our service is going down but the editing workload is increasing um, it's just going up and up and up. So there's more and more editing work um, and less and less translation work. Um, because of the historical importance of UN documents and the political sensitivities involved, our work is can be very challenging, but it's also really interesting. Um, and we translate a huge variety of documents on a huge range of subjects. So um, every document is very different. Um, and similar to what Marie Elena said, um, you really can't be an expert on everything. There's just too much. Um, but you you have to be able to yes, you have to be as she said intellectually curious and um, able to you know research enough to be able to to translate what you've got to translate. But of course, there's a finite amount of time, so you know you can't go into depth. <laughs> um, so the other translation services translate almost exclusively from English, but the nice thing is in the English service, we get to use all of our languages. We um, take full advantage of technology. So we use um, an in-house uh, computer assisted translation tool that we developed here at the UN called eLuna. Um, all translators are also expected to contribute to UN term which is a multilingual um, terminology database, which is actually also accessible to the public 
uh, so you can you can try it out too. Um, and then we follow um, editorial guidelines, of course. Um, we have fairly extensive um, editorial guidelines. The UN editorial manual is available online to anyone, and we also have in-house guidance that's much more extensive. Um, and it really can take years and years to assimilate all the guidance. I've been here for um, seven years, and there's still things I come across that I didn't know about. So um, on to editing, which is increasingly taking up a large um, portion of our time. All, um, well, not all, but almost all documents are reviewed by an editor before they get translated. And the role of the editor is really to ensure that the document is clear, coherent, factually accurate, and suitable for translation, meaning that there's no ambiguities left that could be rendered differently in the other official languages. Because, of course, um, all the language versions have to be uh, as you know identical. Um, Previously, the jobs of editor and translator of the UN were separate, at least at UNHQ, but these days um, there's, there's more intermingling and translators, English translators, now also perform editing functions. So, uh, for instance, for me, I think I spend about 20% of my time translating um, and probably 40% of my time editing, and then the rest is crazy writing, which I'll get onto. Um, when you're editing, it's at least at the UN, um, it's a very specific sort of editing, and we have to be very careful to respect the tone and the voice of the author. So the idea isn't to try and rewrite something the way you would have written it, which can be quite hard sometimes. Um, very often at the UN, people are not drafting in their mother tongue, so the documents can require quite a lot of work. Um, you know, in terms of the English, but the subject matter may be very technical. So um, it can be difficult because it can be something that you really know very little about. So for that reason, we work very closely with the authors and the substantive um, offices to make sure that we've understood um, the document correctly and that our edits aren't changing the meaning of anything. So on to the um, next, next function, um, which is crazy writing, which I think is fairly unique to the UN. Um, crazy writing is essentially producing a summary record of the proceedings of certain UN meetings. Um, crazy writing these days is done exclusively by English translators. Um, it used to be shared around among the language services, but these days it's just done by us in the English translation service. So we will draft the summary record in English and it will then be translated into all the official languages. Speakers can deliver their statements in any of the official UN languages. So if the Precy writer knows the language, they'll listen to the original, otherwise they'll listen to the interpreting and um, yeah, translate it. Oh, sorry, <laughs> not translated. Um, so, crazy writing is really a combination of translation, um, editing, summarizing, and fact checking. Um, so summary records are really important because they're the historical record of what happened at meetings, and member states uh, do often refer back to them. So, it's really important that we get um, that we produce an accurate record of what really happened. Um, Proxy writing is really challenging sometimes because the meetings can be on a vast range of topics. Um, just last week I did um, a meeting on counterterrorism, um, and before that I did one on outer space, uh, what else, um, international law. I also work um, a lot with the fourth committee which is about non-self-governing territories and there there's a whole um, very specific vocabulary. So um, really a lot to learn, um, but super, super interesting too, um, especially for the fourth committee um, that I mentioned on the non-self-governing territories, because there we get petitioners who come from the non-self-governing territories uh, who present their case to the UN. So that's really fascinating. As I mentioned, crazy writing makes up a very large proportion of our work, and we do outsource 
some of this work, it's about 30 to 50% of our total workload. And in Geneva, they have even more crazy writing than in New York. The, um, the next area I'm going to talk about is verbatim reporting, which again, I think is um, fairly unique to the UN. Um, essentially, it's a verbatim or word for word record of a meeting, and it's specifically for meetings mainly of the Security Council, but certain other UN bodies that aren't entitled to summary records. Uh, so they are issued simultaneously in all six official languages. Um, so the turnaround times are very, very tight. Um, in the case of the Security Council, the record is expected to be out uh, the very next day. So essentially they, they have to get it done overnight. Um, Verbatim reporting is a combination of translation, editing, transcription, and a certain amount of fact-checking. Uh, as I said, the deadlines are very, very tight. Um, but the nice thing is with verbatim reporting, um, each reporter gets assigned three 10-minute chunks of a meeting to write up every day. And basically, once you're done with that, you're done for the day. So um, some days, you may be working very, very late, but other days you may get a, a sort of easier take and that's it. You know, if you're done at three, you're done at three and that's it for the day. But some days you may be working extremely late. In the past, they had to be present in the meeting rooms, uh, but these days uh, they don't. They work from the office um, and they're sent the recordings electronically. Um, yeah. Oh, and I didn't mention all verbatim reporting posts are located in New York. And lastly, interpretation, um, which I don't know a huge amount about because I'm not an interpreter, but um, I have spoken to my friend who's an interpreter here and who I went to Bath with. Um, so here's what I know. <laughs> um, interpreters will interpret at the UN only into their main language, except for the Arabic and Chinese booths interpreters who work in both directions. Um, interpreters are typically assigned to interpret seven or eight three-hour meetings per week, and they work in teams of two or three, and they swap over every 20 or 30 minutes. Um, the nice thing about interpreting is that there's a certain amount of travel. Um, to service meetings away from the duty station, particularly if you work in Geneva, um, there's a lot of travel. Um, so as I mentioned, so participants, the participants can speak in any of the six official languages, but that means that very often they're not speaking in their mother tongue. So um, that can be a real challenge for the interpreters. And on top of that, the UN um, tends to have fairly strict time limits um, during meetings for the length of statements. So um, during the General Assembly, the committee meetings, the um, time limit is often just two or three minutes. So what speakers tend to try and do is speak as fast as possible in order to get as much of their statement delivered as, you know, as they can. So that makes it very, very difficult for the interpreters. Um, I'm now going to talk about um, the um, exam procedure for interpreters, so how, how, you, how you get in, basically. Um, interpreters are recruited through the um, competitive exam for language positions, which we call the SELP. They're held on average every two or three years, or as required, basically when the roster runs out. Candidates um, generally have to be able to interpret from two official languages into their main language. Um, however, for Arabic and Chinese, you usually just have to be able to interpret um, both ways into English, so from Chinese into English and back, and the same uh, for Arabic. Um, the, these days, the exam is held entirely online. Um, the whole process, including the final com competency-based interview. Candidates um, are given access to the platform a week before, so they do have time to test it out. 
candidates um, have to interpret three 10 minute speeches of increasing difficulty in both their languages. So, um, so that's the, yeah, three 10 minute speeches in both languages. Um, and once you, if you pass, pass that part, you'll be invited to the competency based interview, um, also held online. And um, if you pass that, you'll be placed on the roster. Um, and then you will be offered a job as and when one comes up, a staff, a staff job. Now, if you don't quite pass the um, the exam, but you're you're you know you do very well, but you're not quite up to the level required for an in-house post, you um, may be um, placed on what we call the global language register and be offered um, freelance work. Um, so on to um, exams for translators, editors and verbatim reporters. Um, since a few years ago, this has been, um, it's now a combined exam. These used to be separate exams, but these days it's a combined exam. So if you pass um, the exam, you'll be eligible for um, um, any of these positions. It's an uh, entirely online exam comprising translation, editing, and summary writing exercises. Um, sorry, I've lost my flow. Um, yes, yeah, so it's conducted entirely online, unlike in the past where it was um, all on paper and you had to actually physically travel to the test center. Um, what we're looking for really are um, enthusiastic language professionals who have a native command of English, excellent knowledge of at least two other official languages, analytical and drafting skills, willingness to learn and versatility, flexibility, teamwork and ability to work under pressure. So the analytical and drafting skills are really important because that's what's needed to produce good summary records and we need um, people who can write well and clearly in English. Um, and willingness to learn is important because of the huge variety of topics we cover and the different functions um, linguists are expected to perform. So in my day-to-day -day job, one day I might be editing, the next I might be pre writing and then back to translation. So there's a lot of task switching um, and overall it's just a lot to learn. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, the exam um, is entirely online and um, we use totally anonymous exams to identify language professionals with the right skill sets. The exams are administered by the Office of Human Resources and not by us. However, we do set the exam papers and we mark the scripts. All exam papers are graded anonymously uh, with two graders who work independently. Um, as for the interpreting exam, candidates will get access to a trial version a week before, so you do get time to practice to make sure you're comfortable with the platform. Um, this is just to give you a quick idea of what the exam might look like the next time it comes up. It's a pretty intense exam, a multi-part exam, and you have, to be able, you have to pass each part of the test to be able to move on to the next. So the first part is, um, uh, four different skills tests. There are two translation exercises, an editing exercise and a summary writing exercise. Um, during, in the first part, usually you can use any resources you want, um, but you can't consult anyone, of course. And the second part, um, you only have access to one designated online dictionary and it's proctored, meaning that you'll be monitored with special software while you're doing it. Um, yeah. So part two, this past time that we had the exam was um, two translation exercises and an editing exercise and a summary writing exercise. And if you pass part two, you're invited to part three, which is a competency based interview, possibly preceded by a live translation or editing exercise. That's how it was in 2022. So essentially before the um, interview, you're invited to share your screen and you will be given a text to edit or translate uh, live and the panel be, will be watching you. 
to see how you do. Um, as for the um, interpreting, if you don't quite pass the the SELP, but you do, you know, you do well, especially if you do well in a particular area, but perhaps you 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 weren't, um, you know, for instance, if you did very well in Arabic to English translation, you might be offered a um, you might be placed on the Global Language Register and offered freelance work in the future. Occasionally, we do also um, hold uh, specific exams for the Global Language Register, and these are a bit like a mini version of this longer um, SELP, and um, that's to be offered freelance work. And the requirements for this vary, but usually you don't have to have two official languages, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how to apply, um, the next time there's an exam, whether it's for the CELP or for the Global Language Register, it will be advertised um, as a job opening on the UN Careers website, and you will have to submit an application for the, through the UN Human Resources Portal. All applications are screened, and applicants who meet the basic eligibility requirements will be invited to sit the first part of the exam. So the um, basic eligibility requirements uh, for an in-house um, job at the UN are age 56 or younger. You have to have um, a, an undergraduate degree in a relevant subject, um, but by relevant there's a fairly wide range of what's considered relevant, so um, journalism, law, uh, politics, finance. It, it's you know, basically you have to have an undergraduate degree. Um, for languages, obviously excellent command of English and knowledge of two official UN languages, and you don't need to have any work experience whatsoever. And we welcome all nationalities, particularly looking for people who are from underrepresented countries. So we, um, yeah, we would love to have applications from people from African countries, the Caribbean, Australia, New Zealand, and um, Singapore, because uh, we don't have, yeah, we kind of overrepresented um, too many Brits and Americans. In terms of how recruitment actually works, once you've been placed on the roster, uh, you it's a matter of time before well, you have to wait essentially for a vacancy to come up. It could be a month, it could be several years. Um, but in the meantime, uh, candidates who are on the roster will often be offered freelance work. Um, you'll then be offered an, an initial appointment for a probationary period of two years. Um, and in that two year period, we offer intensive training you'll be assigned a mentor, um, all your work will be revised of course, and there's, um, yeah, there's a whole in-house training programme. And then if you successfully complete the two-year probation, um, you'll be offered a continuing appointment for five years, which is renewable. So these are, this is how to um, stay in touch with us. As I mentioned, if there's an exam coming up, it will be posted on the UN Careers website. And the best way to uh, really find out about what's going on is to follow us on Facebook. Um, if you look up UN TGACM, which stands for Department for General Assembly and Conference Management, that's where all the job openings um, and opportunities are posted. Uh, so that's really the best place to to yeah to see what's going on. Thanks so much for um, attending today. I hope this was useful. Um, sorry, I was a little nervous. Uh, that's why I'm a translator and I sit behind my desk. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an interpreter, um, but yes, I hope this was useful. Thank you so much, Megan. That was absolutely brilliant um, and, and gave us a, a fantastic feel of, of what it's like to work for the UN. Um, I wonder, could could I ask the same question I asked Marilena and just uh, ask you to explain your own personal journey? How did you come about um, to be working as a translator for um, for the UN? Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, similarly, uh, while I was at university, I wasn't 
I was studying uh, languages, I, but I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. And um, I had the opportunity to go off on an Erasmus year uh, to Spain. And while I was there, I um, did a couple of translation modules at the university and I found I absolutely loved it. And so then I started looking into um, uh, translation programs and I found the translation program at the University of Bath, which sounded great. So I ended up going to Bath. I studied there. Um, I absolutely loved the course. And while I was there, the, the UN held an exam. And at that time, the exams, as I mentioned, were you had to actually travel to the test centre. And I was lucky enough that the test centre was actually at the University of Bath. So I sat the exam uh, while I was still a student. Um, I sat both the editing and the translation papers um, and passed the editing paper. And then about a year, it took quite a while, about a year later, I was offered a job in Addis Ababa as an English editor. And um, I mean, I was pretty nervous to go to Ethiopia, to be honest, but I was also, um, you know, I didn't have, a, um, I, I, you know, I didn't have any kids at that time. I wasn't married. So it seemed like a good opportunity. So off I went to Addis and I went, I was there for three years and it was a fantastic experience. Um, and while I was there, I sat the translation paper because at the time these were two separate papers and I was eventually offered a, a job in New York. And so after three years in Addis, I moved to New York and I've been here ever since. Wonderful. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much for that. Um, th there's lots of UN specific questions coming in, but I'm just wondering, looking at the time, whether we should move straight on to um, Louise now, and and then we'll, we'll bring bring you back for the Q and A. Um, okay. So, so uh, thanks once again, um, Megan. So um, uh, could we welcome Louise back, um, who will give us a, a, a more general presentation, um, focusing on how higher education can help um, you gain a career as a as a linguist with the UN and EU. Yes. Bye. Can you see my screen okay, Dom? We, we can do, yes, absolutely. Fantastic, okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, once again. And um, you've just heard about uh, the wide range of opportunities that there are for uh, professional linguists in the international organisations represented here today, the EU and the UN. Um, and the thing I've been asked to talk about is the contribution that higher education institutions can make to paving the way for aspiring linguists to compete for some of these roles. And clearly I'm speaking as a representative of the University of Bath, um, but I'm going to start with some more general thoughts before I tell you about the specific courses that we offer at Bath. So first of all, um, broadly speaking, I would say um, there are two main routes into professional linguist roles at international organisations. Um, they're on the screen here. The first is to do an MA in translation, interpreting or both. And the second is to do the CIOL's uh, diploma in translation. What are the differences? Well, um, they're twofold, I would say. The diploma in translation is language specific. So you need to do one uh, for each language pair that you have. Um, and it's also um, specifically clearly about translation. Whereas on the other hand, um, if you do an MA, you would tend to do that with at least two language pairs and an MA tends to be broader in scope. So it would cover translation and interpreting or possibly translation and editing and other skills as well. Looking at the MA then, um, you again, broadly speaking, have a choice between doing an MA in the UK or abroad. If you do one um, abroad, it tends to last longer, a couple of years instead of one year in the UK. Um, it tends to be cheaper if you do your MA abroad uh, than doing it in the UK. Um, and there are, I think, 
other advantages and disadvantages to take into account as well. It can be advantageous to do an MA in a country in which your language, one of your passive languages perhaps, is spoken. Uh, but on the other hand, it can be a, a big advantage also to be working with fellow students who have the same mother tongue as you. Now, some general thoughts then on how to choose an MA course. Um, so on this slide and the next slide, I've tried to give you some pointers, some suggestions of factors to take into account if you're thinking of doing an MA. Um, there are a range of programmes available. Um, and I would say when choosing your programme, these are the things that you should consider. The first would be the course design. So ideally, you want a course which has been designed with input from international organisations so that it's tailor-made to meet their needs for particular language roles. So you could look not only for modules in translating, but also modules in, for example, editing and precy writing, which we've just heard about from Megan. For interpreting, it's important to check what kind of interpreting is being taught. Uh, for international organisations, as Marilena said, you need to be taught conference interpreting. So that's consecutive and simultaneous interpreting into your mother tongue. Um, a practical focus, look out for a course with a practical rather than an academic focus. There are lots of academic programmes in translation out there and they're fascinating, um, but they're not really going to prepare you for this kind of career. Um, their emphasis would be more on linguistics and translation theory. Um, look for a course that's updated in line with technological and market developments. We all know that things are moving very fast um, at the moment. In particular, uh, translation memory tools. Megan mentioned the UN's in-house CAT tool. Um, so look for a course that's going to teach you how to use CAT tools. AI tools are being developed at the moment uh, to help interpreters in the booth. That's in its infancy, but um, it's developing all the time. Um, there's more and more demand now for post-editing of machine translation and for transcreation, um, in other words, adapting a message from one language to another in a more creative way. Um, so these are new, newish trends. Um, have a look at who's teaching on the course. Um, are they academics or are they practitioners? And um, I suppose I'm bound to say this, but uh, I, I believe strongly that having current practitioners teaching you is a good thing because Practitioners know exactly the standard required by the market and they're up to date with market developments. A few more thoughts. Um, reputation. Uh, what kind of reputation does the course have? Uh, there's a few indicators of reputation listed here. Um, is the course included in um, IEEC's uh, directory? If this is for interpreting courses, IEEC, the International Association of Conference Interpreting, has a schools directory on its website. Um, if the programme is listed there, that's a good sign. Um, is the course supported by the UN and or the EU? If it is, that's a good sign because it demonstrates that they believe it's worthwhile. Have a look at where the alumni are now. Um, see if they're working where you want to work essentially. That would tell you that the course could take you where you want to go. Um, close ties. Does the course have close ties with um, the world of work? So in particular with international organisations but also with other employers. That's important because it's going to maximise your chances of employment after the course. And evidence of those ties could be things like uh, the training opportunities provided during the course, for example, by visiting um, staff from the EU and the UN. It could be placements or study visits um, at international organisations. And obviously, this last point is obvious, but it's uh, extremely important. Make sure that you choose a course which supports your language combination. It was interesting to see the poll at the beginning of this afternoon's round table and to see that 61% of you um, are experienced linguists already. Um, so what I, the point I wanted to make on this slide is um, who and when uh, should think about taking their skills to the next level perhaps, 
um, so that they can compete for the most prestigious uh, language roles? Um, the answer is really that anyone with a passion for languages can uh, compete for these roles. What you need is a solid knowledge of your languages. Um, it certainly is not necessary to be bilingual. Um, I'm living proof of that. I'm from Yorkshire <laughs> um, and I have no languages in my background at all. Um, you do need to be um, a, an articulate user of your mother tongue. That's the most important thing. So you need a solid knowledge of your languages. You need aptitude. And the most important um, aptitude that you need is being a proficient and articulate user of your mother tongue. And then after that, the training provided at an MA will equip you with the necessary skills to succeed. You can do it at any point in your life. Um, so you could train um, straight after an undergraduate degree. You could, after an undergraduate degree, decide to spend some time in uh, the countries where your languages are spoken. That's often a good idea. Um, or you could decide to retrain or um, enhance your skills um, after a first career or after um, a career doing a different kind of languages related job. And at Bath, we have people in all those categories on our master's programmes. So I want to tell you now about the courses that we have at Bath. Um, we have four programmes. You can see them listed here. Two of them are for European languages and two of them are for Chinese and English. Um, so let me tell you a little bit in a little bit more detail about those programmes. First of all, then, what I've called the European Pathways. So these are the two courses that we offer for um, students with European languages, um, for students with an English mother tongue, in fact. Um, the one on the left, MATE, stands for the MA in Interpreting and Translation. The one on the right stands for Translation and Professional Language Skills. So um, both of these programmes have different focuses, as you would expect. The um, MATE teaches you the skills you need to become a translator or interpreter um, and or interpreter, as the name suggests. Um, the language combinations uh, provided for are um, English mother tongue with two languages from French, German, Spanish, Italian and Russian. So two of those languages into English. Uh, we do actually cater also for Russian mother tongues. Um, so it's also possible to do mate um, if you're a Russian mother tongue and you want to do learn to do Russian, English, English, Russian. So as I said, the focus of MATE is on consecutive and simultaneous interpreting, conference interpreting, in other words, and on translation. Um, the core modules are in pink um, on the slide, and then there's a range of um, optional modules, all designed to support your development as a translator and interpreter. So you can see those listed here, things like public speaking, public service interpreting, translation technology. Turning to the TPLS programme then, the focus of the TPLS programme is editing and revision um, and translation. Um, again, with uh, supporting uh, modules for that. TPLS is a special programme because it was, it was literally designed um, with the input of international organisations um, to help them to, to fill the language roles um, that they were struggling to fill. Um, and you'll see listed as one of the options, for example, Precy writing. Um, and Megan has already told us about Precy writing. It's a specific kind of uh, summary record writing that's used at the UN. So students on the TPLS programme, if they have a UN language combination like French and Spanish, um, they often select the Precy writing module. They're taught by, obviously, a freelance Precy writer. Um, and often end up working alongside their teacher, um, Precy writing in Geneva. Um, in addition to the modules listed here, there are also some extracurricular non-credit bearing units in English law, in economics and globalisation, for example. Um, this is designed to expand our students' general knowledge. 
And Bath graduates from these programmes have gone on to work as translators, interpreters, editors, verbatim reporters, pricey writers, uh, you name it, for some of the organisations listed at the bottom of the screen. Perhaps one other point I would like to make here is that this unit, Extended Translation Methodology, is a new unit uh, or module which we're launching in October in response to changes in the market. Um, it's going to formalise some of the more ad hoc input that we have had, that we've been developing really over recent years. Um, so that will cover things like uh, post-editing of machine translation and transcreation. Um, so that's a, a good example of the course being updated to uh, the needs of the market. Moving on to our Chinese pathways, and I'll cover these more briefly, um, but essentially we have two programmes here for students offering English to Chinese and Chinese to English. Um, uh, MATE Chinese focuses on translation and interpreting. Uh, both conference interpreting and liaison uh, and public service interpreting. And um, TBI is designed very much for um, the business needs of the Chinese market. Um, you'll see there's no optionality there at all. It's uh, tailor-made for students wishing to go back to China to work um, on the Chinese market in business or actually in universities. And again, you can see uh, where our graduates have ended up uh, a wide range of places. So to sum up the offer um, of BATH, the key points are that we offer a suite of four programmes, um, all of which um, are different but complementary. And this is what they all have in common. So they are very practical courses, they're vocational courses in other words. Um, the teachers um, are experienced, um, both as teachers and as professional linguists. Um, most of us are part-timers. Um, I myself teach uh, one day a week in Bath on a Friday, and the rest of the time I'm translating and interpreting for international organisations. We have close links uh, with international organisations at Bath, including Memoranda of Understanding with the European Parliament and the United Nations. Uh, we also receive a lot of pedagogical assistance from SCIC. Uh, Marilena herself visited us uh, last summer to help with our summer interpreting course, in fact. Um, so these close links um, mean in practice that we're the happy recipients of in-person and remote training delivered by our partners. Um, I've listed the UN, the EU institutions, also the European Central Bank comes once a year. Um, our colleagues in international organisations often act as external examiners or attend our final exams as observers. Um, and this is very helpful. They come to spot talent, um, but they also provide guidance to our graduates. And this helps us to benchmark our exams against professional tests giving our qualifications uh, credibility. Finally, our alumni network work. Um, through our alumni, we have links with a wide range of employers, of professional linguists, which is obviously great for uh, job opportunities for our students. And while our focus is on training linguists for roles in international organisations, our alumni have also gone on to work for a wide variety of other employers, and that really has given us an unrivalled network of contacts. Now, the point I wanted to make here um, really is that you might think doing an MA in translation and interpreting or professional language skills is a bit of a niche choice. Um, but I would like to persuade you otherwise, and I think, well, hopefully this afternoon's round table will uh, have indeed have convinced you of that. You might think that doing an MA like uh, the ones I've described would narrow your choice of career, but in fact, the opposite is true, because these kinds of courses um, open the doors, actually, to a wide range of careers as a professional linguist. And we've heard about many of those from Marilena and Megan, um, and I've listed some of them and a few more um, on the slide. So 
So in summary, um, summing up probably not only what I've said, but also really the message um, of this round table this afternoon is that there's strong demand um, at the moment for well-qualified English mother tongue linguists in international organisations. So now is the perfect time to consider a career as a translator or interpreter, or consider enhancing your skills so that you can compete for some of these prestigious roles. As we all know, regrettably, the number of students studying modern foreign languages at UK schools and universities has fallen dramatically. And that means that if you've got a degree in modern languages, you have some skills which are highly sought after. Um, it's not just translators and interpreters who are in short supply, but also many related language ca uh, careers, um, such as editors, such as proofreaders, such as pracy writers. And um, this is all despite various, what we might term challenges. Um, Brexit being one of them, Marilena has already mentioned that uh, Brexit means that UK, if you're only a UK national, you can't uh, be a staff translator or interpreter at the EU anymore, but you can still be a freelancer, um, as I am, and as most, um, most interpreters are actually. Um, advances in technology, including AI, will of course continue to change the profession but uh, professional linguists need to simply understand the tools available. We need to do that so that we can understand their limitations and so that we can understand how they can help us to do a better job. And the role of higher education institutions is um, to conclude, to provide tailor-made training in the necessary skills to open the door to some of these very exciting opportunities. So that's all from me for now, um, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. And um, as the others have said, I hope this has been useful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Um, that's that's absolutely brilliant and fascinating. And um, we will now move on to the um, to the uh, panel section. Um, and we will we ha don't have very much time, and we have very very many questions. Um, so uh, I'll apologise in advance that we're not going to be able to cover all the, the questions. Um, I think what we may do, if, if, if everyone is okay with that, is, is actually um, do a follow-up where we answer some of the questions um, uh, in, in, in writing um, that, that we've um, received. But um, I'll try and categorise uh, some, some, some of the questions. Um, so lots of questions about sort of age and experience and, and, and who, who, who is this for? Um, a number of the sort of more experienced um, um, translators or linguists saying have they have they missed the boat? Um, I know we saw um, 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 age limits for the UN. Uh, also, Marilena, you were saying that that the, the age profile is a bit on the older side. We also have younger uh, linguists saying it, it, is there too much requirement for for experience at the EU and and so forth. So, lots of questions in that. Um, thing. It'd just be interesting to know a little bit more about the general sort of age um, profiles and, and how mixed they are and, and um, uh, how you encourage people of um, different ages to, to join the, the EU and the uh, UN. Um, who would like to take that? Uh, Marilena, do you want to talk about the EU first? Sure. Yes, yes. Um, actually, I have to agree with Louise in what she said on one of her slides about actually there is that there's no one pathway into um, interpreting and there's no one set age either. Um, the point I was making about the wine glass is that actually we're not getting as much new blood in and a lot of our older colleagues are retiring. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we only need young graduates in. Um, we need anybody with a passion and with the talent to do it. In terms of the age limit, I, um, for staff, um, it's obligatory to retire at 63 with a possibility to extend to 65, but not beyond. And for freelance colleagues, it's slightly, it differs, I think, across the institutions. I think the European Parliament doesn't have a cutoff age, but I have a feeling that for DG Skik, it might be 65 or 67. I'm not 100% sure on that one. I'd have to come back to you. But, um, but no, aside from that, no other uh, kind of age instructions or prescriptions. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Um, I don't know, Megan, if you'd have anything to, to add on that? Um, well, just very quickly, um, yes, yeah, so we do have this upper age limit of 56, that's for in-house staff positions, but there's no age limit for freelance work, of course, um, um, and no experience is required to, to sit any of the exams, and lots of people do pass with no formal work experience. I passed when I had no experience at all, so Okay, and, and just while we're on the, actually, uh, Megan, while you're having a presentation, there are lots of questions about the, the formats for the exams for the UN. Yeah. A little bit more detail about how they work, and, and also, um, are they the same if, if, if you're translating um, into a language other, other than English? Um, no, they're not the same, because um, our, we're quite unique in the English service because we perform these different functions. So we do the editing, the crazy writing, and the translation, whereas the other language services who are translating um, into languages other than English, they are essentially only translating from their language into English all the time, and that's basically all they do. So their exams look quite different, um, but it will still be an online process, um, probably a multi-part exam, uh, followed by a competency-based interview. So in that way, it's the same. But they won't have such a variety of exercises. That's that's the, that's our challenge actually when we're looking for candidates is because you have to be really good across the board in all these different areas, which is what makes it very difficult. You can't just be a great editor; you have to be a great translator as well. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay, um, and 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 we heard obviously about how um, uh, you you have to sort of have these mobility requirements with with the UN. Um, there was a question actually um, for, for you, Mar Marilena, um, about um, freelancers and, and whether you still need to live in, in Brussels or, or, or close to Brussels in order to get freelance work. Um, I think this varies as well. I think it's true to say that if you're in Brussels, you have you stand more of a chance of getting work and more work because you are, dare I say it, cheaper in inverted commerce because uh, as a local you know your travel expenses don't need to be covered your per diems don't need to be covered accommodation etc um that said it is possible to have a professional domicile outside of brussels um and still get work um, the european the european parliament for example brings in a lot of freelance colleagues from different places uh, and obviously there are missions to strasbourg um, and there are there are there are missions outside of brussels as well uh, for the commission um so i think it's safe to say as an English native speaker, more work, more chance of work if you're local, so based in Brussels, but um, that doesn't mean that you can't be based outside of Brussels um, and still get work. I hope that's not too much of a cop-out reply. <laughs> oh, that, 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 that's great, okay. Um, and um, just um, lots of questions about sort of other other languages, so for example, with, with the, the um, UN, um, uh, can you use other languages working as um, freelance are there opportunities for lots of people have mentioned um, different languages that aren't the official languages uh, and, and also lots of questions uh, around the trends and the, what are the most popular languages other than English both at the UN and, and, and the EU. Can I maybe ask you Megan first on that? Okay, um, so there's there's quite a lot of Arabic and translate um, Arabic and Russian that comes in. So we and we particularly need people with Arabic. That's what we're really looking for and what we really struggle to find. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of um, non-official languages for freelancers, that I'm really not too sure about. I think the volume is so small. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think there's a huge huge need for that really unfortunately it's really the UN languages that we're looking for okay and I think Marilena you said maybe you'd come back but was it Spanish Portuguese and Bulgarian for, um, for my notes uh, well that was that was uh, in terms of those units that are losing staff as well but it, from a purely English unit point of view um, French and Spanish is our most common um, newcomer profile but what we really need and like uh, German, Italian, 
uh, Portuguese were quite short of as well. Okay, 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 um, fascinating. Okay, um, and um, um, so lots of questions also about university um, courses and, and MAs and asking for recommendations. I'm not sure maybe we could do recommendations on, on, on individual um, courses here, but, but a, a sort of general question a few people have asked, um, asked, you know, um, comparing sort of a UK MA a, a, and an international MA, and is, is there kind of any difference? I don't know whether either Brexit's affected anything or, or, or whether um, you know, UK ones might be better regarded than some in some other countries. I, I, I don't know. And, uh, is, is there anything, either Louise, maybe first, and, uh, and then maybe Marilyn or Megan, if you had any comments on, on that? Hmm. <laughs> it's. I think with courses, the proof of the it's the proof of the puddings in the eating. That's the answer, you know. So, um, I think if you apply the criteria that I mentioned in the presentation to um, any course, whether it's in the UK or abroad, that's probably going to give you your answer. Um, so, there are good courses abroad. There are bad courses abroad. There are good courses in the UK. There are less good courses in the UK. Um, but if you try to evaluate them, um, thinking about what you want to get out of the course. Um, then that will that will give you your answer. Um, otherwise, really, all I can say is what I said in the presentation, which is that courses abroad tend to be longer, but cheaper, because tuition fees are quite high in the UK. It is an investment. Okay. Um, do do, do, I, do you have any comments on that? And um, you've both taken obviously. A, degrees in or MAs in the in in, in the UK um but does it make a, a difference or is it it's, it's presumably purely on on the university rather than the, the country that you take it in yeah no I think I, I would just agree with what Louise said there what I can say it, though is that we um in terms of our accreditation tests and the the newly accredited interpreters that we get coming through we see them come in from a range of different universities not not just the uk universities so mm -hmm. um yeah everything is possible i think it depends on, on on what you're looking for perhaps and what possibilities you might have um you know in terms of moving abroad or not moving abroad okay great okay um, well, perhaps, uh, and with apologies to everyone whose questions we haven't read, there, there, there are far too many, but there's quite a few on pay, uh, and I don't know if there's anything you can say say, say, say on that, um, you know, just to get, get a feel for the kind of um, um, pay that there may be with, with roles within the EU and, and the UN. Who would like to take that? Um, Marilena, again, do you want to? Um... Uh, to my shame, actually, I don't have the figures to hand. Um, I'm, I was looking at Louise or trying to catch her eye across the screen. And she might know um, off the top of her head yeah. a bit more for the, EU, for the EU, at least. Yeah, I'm just looking it up. <laughs> uh, so, well, it's um, it, as a freelancer um, interpreting for the EU we are recruited on a daily basis um, and that is um, that that's how you're recruited across um, all international organizations you're recruited by the day so you receive a daily fee and the daily fee for um, the eu um, is about 500 euros at the moment um, i think when when thinking about this kind of thing it's important to bear in mind um, uh, well, two points really. One is that uh, that's 500 euros net because um, if you work for either the EU or the UN, your pay isn't uh, subject to UK tax. Um, for the EU, you pay tax directly to the EU at a slightly lower rate. It's about 18%, um, but that's um, taken off um, at source. Um, and for the UN, yes, there's also a little bit of tax taken off, but when you receive it, you don't have to pay any UK tax on it. And the other thing to bear in mind with pay is that um, as a freelance interpreter, you can't work every day. <laughs> you can't have a contract every day uh, because you would um, A, exhaust yourself and B, you wouldn't do a good job because you need to prepare. Um, and preparation can take um, sometimes a full day for a day's work. So 500 euros sounds like a lot, but if you uh, need to spend a day preparing, that's 250 euros a day. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that that's very very helpful. Um. Well. Um. Th thank you. Uh. We we it's three thirty in the UK already, so we have actually run um to the end of um this. Um, really fascinating and, and, and inspiring roundtable. Um, as I say, we've run out of time. Um, all um, attendees, you will receive a certificate and a link to the recording within a few working days. Um, if you're a CLR member, you can also log this um, event on my CPD. Um, so all that remains is to thank uh, once again our panelists, uh, Megan, Marilena and Louise. Um, for their valuable contributions and um, to once again thank you for listening and participating in our roundtable. Um, we will send a follow-up as I mentioned um, with, with more information and I would like to thank you all once again for attending and say goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks, bye.